All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sandra Mignon. I work with Plan International. I'm a CAFAG advisor, and I'm also the co-lead of the CAFAG Task Force. So if you wonder what CAFAG stands for, this is uh, children associated with armed forces and armed groups. So in this session, we're going to talk about all the resources that we have developed in the past few years and uh, the dissemination strategy that we put in place uh, to make sure all of these resources are well um, disseminated, that people know about them and they know how to use them. So before I get started, I'd like just to show a show of hand, just to know um, who in this room knows about the CAFAC Task Force. You heard about it before? Okay, now uh, we have a good half. Good. And how many of you are already familiar with the resources that we have developed? Uh, maybe a few less. Okay, all right. So hopefully this session will still be useful for you. So this is um, an overview of all the resources that we have developed. Um, so this task force is quite new, newish, I would say. Um, it's four years old. And in four years, thanks to all of our active members, we have developed, I think it's seven resources. So have been quite productive. And this was really to respond to a need that we received from field practitioners that this field of work is quite technical, it's quite difficult. And, um, and four years ago, there wasn't many, many guidance for field practitioners, for NGOs. There was a bit in more like MRM um, or maybe a little bit in legal framework, but something really practical for child protection actors on how do we respond to the needs of these children in these complex emergencies. Um, there wasn't much. So we were trying really to respond to this need and making sure that these uh, resources are done or developed through an interagency approach. So it's not just one NGO saying, this is what I think we should do. This is a collective effort of all of our members to say collectively from all of our experience, this is uh, what we think is best um, to approach this, uh, these issues. So very quickly, um, I will go through a bit deeper in the second part of this session, but briefly, we've developed a program development toolkit on how do we design programs for children, for CAFAG. We have um, two technical notes on education interventions for CAFAG and livelihood. We've done one, actually that one was the first one on girls. In this uh, CAFAG issue, we tend to think more about boys and girls uh, are invisible quite often. So like, what do we need to do specifically for girls? What are their needs and how do we address them? Um, then there was the operational guidance on MHPSS that was uh, led by UNICEF and the uh, MHPSS Collaborative. This one is still a field uh, test version. We have the operational guidance on handover protocol. So how do we negotiate with the government when security forces um, identify children, sometimes arrest them. So how do we uh, make sure the children are handed over then to the civil society and to child protection actors? And uh, this one, uh, so that one was done with, uh, led by Watchlist. And IRC, who has worked on the parenting skills program. So these are like sessions. There are 20 sessions that you can directly implement with parents so that they, they know how to welcome back the children, they know how to, they understand their needs. Often there are a lot of challenges in the families when children come back from armed forces and armed groups, so as to facilitate this process. So these are all the resources. Um, I should also mention that most of them are translated in French, Spanish, and Arabic. So you will find them on the tables, you have actually QR codes with uh, the links to uh, these different resources. All right. So now we have developed all of these resources and then we felt maybe we should, maybe we should slow down on developing new things and then um, just take the time to make sure what we have worked, uh, what we have developed is known, is used by the field practitioners. You know, sometimes there is like this profusion of 
of resources that it's hard to take a step back and then really see like, is this useful for me? How do I implement this, uh, this document? So now we, um, we started a few months ago uh, a new project with really the focus of disseminating, socializing all of these resources. And we do that at different levels. So we would do that at the national level, so working with the CPORs, um, for example, this coordination mechanism to, to um, disseminate the resources. We work at the regional level, organizational level, so organizations who are interested to disseminate this within their own teams and at the global level. So what does this mean practically? So we have global conferences like this one, which is a, a great opportunity to talk about these resources, make sure people know about them. Um, there are online webinars, online training that we do. So like the CAFAC Task Force is actually doing this webinar series where every four months we have a webinar on a particular topic. Um, and that is also translated in all languages. So we have simultaneous translation in Spanish, French and Arabic systematically. The recordings of these webinars are available on our uh, YouTube channel. We have developed a MOOC. So MOOC is a massive open online course. So one of the resource, this one, like the toolkit has been adapted to this online platform. It's on FutureLearn. It's translated also in Spanish and French. And basically you can embark on a six weeks program with about three hours of work per week. So we try to make it manageable with videos, quizzes, activities, so that you basically unpack all this quite a big resource into small chunks so it's more digestible. And then you receive a certificate at the end. And um, yeah, so that's uh, how to also, another way to disseminate uh, this, uh, this resource. We have planned this year also a global training of trainer on this resource. So for those who are interested in then rolling out these resources in your countries, um, feel free to come to me at the end of the session. We have two global uh, training of trainer planned this year, one in French in Dakar in October, and then one in English in Nairobi in December. So the idea of the people who are coming is that these are people who are in charge of um, for example, there are regional advisors on child protection. They, are, they can be national advisors, they can be CPOR coordinators, and their role will then be to disseminate and replicate the training in their countries. We are planning one in Arabic in 2005, fingers crossed if we get the funding, uh, so, uh, but that's, that's the plan. So that's at the global level. At the organizational level, um, I started doing online sessions, so like working with some of the organizations, um, mainly members of the CAFAC Task Force, but if you're interested, same, feel free to come to me. And then um, we have selected some of those um, resources that some organization felt were needed, and then uh, organized some like two-hour session. Um, I see Marcelo noting over there, we've been working together with Street Child, to disseminate some of these resources uh, for their team. So this is the list of the resources that, that we, we can do, um, we can disseminate online. The toolkit, I tend not to do it because it's just so big that it doesn't really make sense to do like a two hour session on it. And I think we prioritize the global TOTs and the MOOC um, to disseminate that one. Um, then we work at the regional, and national level. So there, we do like regional conferences. Um, there are also regional webinars that are more tailored to the needs of a particular region. We can do it in French as well, I'm a French speaker. And uh, I also work with a few uh, schools, the Beaufort School, if you know them, like they're a French, um, they have a French uh, child protection program and they have a module on CAFAG. I worked with the PDP, so like the professional development program on, uh, also they have a module on CAFAG. And then we have webinars that are adapted to the needs of a particular country. 
So for example, in uh, Central African Republic, the CPOR said, oh, we're interested in uh, the livelihood technical notes. Can you do a session for teams in French with examples from, um, from CAR? And that, you know, so I can adapt and, and do that to, uh, to accommodate uh, you, your needs. And more recently, I've been working with uh, Cox Bazaar, where this is an emerging issue. And, and, and there the needs were more on case management, which is not one of the tools that we have. But we basically pulled from all the different resources and uh, did like a three hour online session for the case workers from Cox, from, uh, Cox Bazaar. So that's also possible. So like if you have like specific needs on prevention, for example, um, you know, so feel free to ask and then I can always adapt the, the, the session to, uh, to your needs. So that's, um, yeah, I'm just gonna pause here and see if there are any questions so far. No, okay. So um, now I'm just gonna um, go a bit deeper into some of these resources. So this is um, the program development toolkit. So this one, uh, the idea is to accompany field practitioners on how to design a program for CAFAG following the project cycle. So like really from the start, so like the, the first module is like kind of setting the ground, who are CAFAG, but also the legal framework that then we adapt to the, the context. Then it's developing a context analysis. So like understanding what are the trends in your country? Um, how children are being recruited, who is involved, how do they exit armed forces and armed groups, what are the challenges that they face when they go back to their community, what is specific to your context, and then the methodology, so it's a methodology because obviously each context is different, so it's how do you collect this data involving CAFAG, and I want to point that because it's not often, um, it's not always easy and a lot of organizations prefer not to involve them because they feel that it's too dangerous or maybe we risk doing harm. So here you have a methodology on how to do that safely. So it's a workshop that you do with CAFAG. So you learn from them. What does it mean for them to be reintegrated? The idea of reintegration is very different from one country to another. And if you ask boys and girls separately, you will have also a different understanding. So it's asking all of these questions, documenting what is specific to your country and then adapting the program. And that's the bit that often gets lost. We collect data, we have beautiful reports. When it comes to program, we always do the same thing. So here the idea is, how do we adapt our program to really respond to these needs that we, that we identified in your, in your country? Maybe they don't need vocational training in hairdressing. So um, that's really understanding and, and that's the methodology you will find in this resource. Um, here we look at prevention, release and reintegration. So these are like the three steps that we usually follow with these uh, programs. You can decide to only focus on reintegration and that's fine, but you will find all the resources in this, uh, in this tool. And then you have the program implementation and the learning and evaluation. So this, Toolkit is really focused, is, it's more for like advisor level, coordinators, uh, program manager. It's not for caseworkers, right? Then on the girls, so like this is um, a technical note focusing on girls. As I mentioned earlier, often um, the programs are designed with boys in mind. So like with the boys are more visible, they're there, they make noise, they are seen as a security threat in a lot of countries. And then um, all the actors really design the program with them in mind. And girls are often there too. Um, they are less visible. They are the wife of uh, the fighters. They are like sexually abused. They're, they play different roles that are less visible. Uh, sometimes they don't have, they don't carry the weapons. And so they are not seen as this security threat in the same way that boys do. And as a result, all the programs, we, we, we don't do it in a, in a gender sensitive manner. We basically ignore their needs. And what happens is that we don't identify them. Even in the identification process, there are countries who say, oh, we don't have girls in this country. 
And then when they change the approach, all of a sudden you have 38% of girls. So uh, this is actually the example of South Sudan, 2018, 2% of girls, 2019, 38%, just because they changed the approach on how they uh, identify children. So it's understanding what is specific to them and how do we need to adapt our program so that we respond to their needs. I actually talked to a girl who was recruited by the FARC in Colombia. And what she told me is that she was pregnant. And in Colombia, actually, the services are pretty, pretty good. The government has quite a lot of money, uh, has invested a lot in, this, in these programs, and then they have access to all kinds of services. But what she told me is that the services were on the other side of town. She was heavily pregnant. And then no one, you know, even cared about it. So like she couldn't attend all the sessions, she missed half of it because she was sick, she couldn't take the public transportation. Like they didn't adapt this program to her needs and as a result, like she missed a part of the, of the vocational trainings that she could have attended. To uh, girls who come back with children, they care for two, right? Um, so if you provide the same services to boys and girls and expect them to attend you know, the, the same session without catering for the needs of, uh, of mothers, then they won't be able to attend if no one is looking after their babies. When you provide food, you need to provide food for the baby as well. So all of these things, um, there are like uh, lots of recommendations in these uh, resources on how to adapt the, those needs, uh, how to adapt the programs to the girls so that we, um, we are more gender um, responsive. Okay, this one is on education. Uh, we have, it's actually a series of two. We have um, these two techni technical notes on education and livelihood. It's cross-sectoral work. When it comes to CAFAG, the needs are so big, you need to respond to all the well-being domain. It means like education, um, education, livelihood, health. Uh, you have uh, justice, so it's so many actors. Child protection actors can't do it alone. We need to engage the other sectors. So these are technical notes on how to do that, how, how to engage other sectors, um, what is our added value as child protection actors, and what can they bring to the table. Um, in these resources, you will find like key intervention challenges, but also lessons learned on how to do this uh, well. And then we have the same on uh, livelihood. The livelihood one has also a theory of change which helps you to understand if you want to design your programs, what are the different steps to, uh, to follow. Then there is the MHPSS operational guidance. So this one is, um, hasn't been really field tested yet. So it's still um, in a field test version. We have the plan to roll it out in a few countries, test it and then uh, refine it. Um, so this one like brings the core approaches in terms of prevention, release, and reintegration uh, in terms of MHPSS, some indicators, key competencies, and it's all linked to other resources. So if you're familiar with Equip, for example, which is a key competency um, platform on MHPSS, it's all interlinked. So it's nothing different here um, that you will find there. And then the growing stronger together. Um, so I mentioned earlier, like these are parenting skill sessions, um, looking at how do you help parents to understand what are the consequences of child recruitment? How can we uh, better understand the gender specific needs and improve the parent-child relationship? You know, when these children come back, they were often in like positions of power. Some of them had weapons, they had a status when they were in these armed groups. And then when they go back home, they go back as a, as a, we expect them to go back there as a child and to go back to where they left it maybe a few years ago. And that often doesn't have, <laughs> doesn't go well because they had a whole experience now and then everybody needs to adjust. So helping parents is really key. It's actually one of the most important aspects um, I've done some research on, on mental health, and if we look at the research, the children who are doing the best and who have like less uh, psychosocial um, 
uh, psychosocial uh, outcomes in terms of PTSD, anxiety, depression. Are those, among other factors, who were well um, received at home, who were welcomed back with open arms, where parents really try to understand what happened to them. And so these programs are really helpful to prepare the reunification. Even before the child is, has been identified, you can prepare the parents um, before the child is reunified with the family. And the last one is the handover protocol. So here is like all this guidance on how do you negotiate with, with government, uh, with the security sector as well. They often have like a different perspective. Um, they really see those children as security threats. They have a lot of pressure from their country to, um, to secure uh, the, the, they have a lot of pressure from the, the, the population to secure the country. And so this is, these guidance help you to negotiate and, and make sure that child rights are respected, that children are considered as victims uh, in this process. And that was the last one. <laughs> okay. Any questions on these resources? Yeah, it's, it's not a question, but uh, a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, thank you very much for doing this presentation. Uh, it's a testimony for me that uh, these uh, tools are really working and uh, helping those who are in the field, especially in West and Central Africa, where we have CAFAG as a major issue to implement, to improve the capacity, and also uh, to improve the programming. So this is the testimony. Um, something I wanted to mention, uh, I didn't see here, it's about uh, the strategy or guidance on negotiating with uh, armed groups for the release of uh, children associated with uh, armed groups. And this is beside the handover protocol, which is uh, more often signed between the United Nations and uh, the government. I'm mentioning here uh, the issue of CAFOG who are associated and also surrender along with uh, armed groups during DDR processes, formal or informal DDR processes. This is the question that came to us very often. Are you going to de develop a guidance on how to engage with uh, the armed groups for the release of those children during different uh, form of uh, uh, DDR processes. Thank you. So it's not planned for now. Uh, it's, um, we had few requests, but actually this is something that is so sensitive that most of the NGOs are kind of shying away and they're not very comfortable going up to an armed group and saying, hey, you should release those children. Um, some organizations do, um, but there are very few. And so, so far we haven't got many requests. So if it's something that is coming up more and more, uh, we may think about it, um, but for now this is not in, in the plan. In the case of Colombia, this organization authorized to talk with the armed groups, OICR is the coordinating group that has the authorization to get in touch with them. And they have access to go into the territories where you have armed groups to be able to rescue these children in southern Colombia where I work. This tools have a particular a, a particular set of tools to work with ethnic minorities because they are at high risk when they with, they try to recover these boys and girls and the recruitment figures in Colombia these boys and girls are afro descendants and original people's descendants do you have a specific set of tools to work with these groups thank you No, thank you. Thank you so much. As, as already um, talked to you, we are very interested in Ecuador to 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 have a conversation with you and maybe um, this approach um, related to 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 girls uh, 
related to armed groups. But I wanted to know if if you have a space uh, where we can have this uh, interchange of experiences from other from other countries, or maybe we can prepare a space so we can learn about these specific experiences. Um, besides the guide, the, the guidelines and the toolkits, and maybe if, if we can uh, uh, ask you to, to prepare or maybe to coordinate these spaces. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. This is a, a great question. Uh, yes, there is a space, and actually, I'm going to talk about it um, right after the, the Q and A. Uh, so this is an online uh, platform where you can ask questions. Um, but I think it's th this question is very interesting. I think there is this. Uh, um, I mean, I, I hear two things. I hear people in this region saying we're very different. What happens in this region doesn't apply somewhere else. And then the experience of others don't necessarily apply here. And then I hear other people like you saying, well, actually, we want to learn from what's happening on the other side of the world. How are you dealing with these children? Yes, the context is different. But maybe there are some learning things like approaches that are still applicable and then you can further adapt uh, to your context. And um, as I was thinking, you know, like during the past few days, I, I was imagining like, you know, really a focus on this region. Also, like bringing experiences across all the countries from um, you know, north to south, like on how do you deal with these children? I think there is a lot of learning also already in your region across countries. So um, keeping in mind, maybe one day. Yeah. Here, here, ah, yes. or not, yeah. no, go ahead. Um, so I have a question regarding um, children survivors of sexual violence. I was wondering if within the operational guidance or the other guidance there is a focus on this and also if it goes beyond, let's say, the, um, the gender issue. So there is this guidance on girls in particular, but I'm thinking about also LGBTQI plus children uh, associated with armed forces and, uh, and uh, yeah, whether um, there is guidance also on this. Yeah, unfortunately not, not yet, I want to say. <laughs> It's, uh, it's not something that has been... Oh, so first of all, let me say, respond to the first part of the question on uh, sexual abuse. Yes, there are things in the girls' um, guidance, but we also acknowledge that this happens to boys. So boys are also affected by sexual abuse and sexual violence in different ways. They are sometimes forced to rape um, women, or they can also be uh, subject to sexual abuse as a form of punishment. So like we have the both uh, both situations. So this also happens to to boys definitely, but for now, like most of the the content, I would say you will find it in the the girls' uh, technical note, with like some recommendations on how to approach this. I mean, the level of stigma for these girls is so high that disclosing sexual abuse is um, if they don't have children, it's. Uh, it's you really need to set the, the, the context, build a trust with the girl so that they can disclose. So there is like some recommendations on how to do that. Um, and for the LGBTQI, this is where we are still, I think, lagging behind. Uh, we don't have um, any, any specific resources. I think there is a question on the side. Um, I think, no, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and and uh, I am more um, inclined to say that there's a lot that can be used and that can be adapted in the region. Actually, we are already doing it. Uh, so a lot of the content that are in those uh, guidances and, and, and um, tools at the global level, we've been using it to fit into the first draft policy documents in Mexico for hopefully what mm -hmm. may become the first national policy on the issue, but also at the state level, we already submitted a first draft to one of the states, in this case, Michoacan, and, and they are already working on the legal adoption process. And a lot of the content has come from the global um, um, tools. Now, um, we can spend more time talking about who the perpetrator is in the region and what name we give to the context, or we uh, spend more time talking about the actual impact on the children and the ways of recruitment that are very similar. And the impact, I mean, that's the whole advocacy point, the impact is very similar. 
negatively speaking. So um, I think in our own experience, um, advocating in Mexico for um, hopefully policies at national level, um, that debate is not there. So it's about the content, the needs of the children, what programs the government can put in place, and what can be um, taken from these tools. So I think there is, um, I think, room um, for uh, maybe even adapting some of these already existing materials, uh, bringing possibly trainings um, um, to the government. We've been training the government uh, in Mexico, um, but I think there is there's even political space to do that and, and, and bring governments together and, and look into these tools and see what can be used and utilized beyond what name we give to the context, uh, whether it's some violence or you know not getting into political debate that is not useful to children mm -hmm. or who the perpetrator is, if it's an organized crime, if it's a gang, if it's an armed group, so if, what's the difference between. So if we focus on the content and the programs and the children's needs, I think we can advance and progress. So I do think there is a political space um, to bring these tools to the region and to have a discussion with governments around this area. Thank you. Thank you. This is music to my ears. <laughs> So, Sandra, before, sorry, before we get to the next question, I don't know if you had a chance to respond to the, the first colleague that asked about um, incorporating um, ethnic minorities or how do you oh. consider ethnic minorities in terms of the protocols that you, that you do? All right, sorry, I missed that in the translation. Um, all the tools that we have are all basically saying you need to understand first your context, you know? And then this is a methodology to say what is specific to your context and then how do you adapt it to, um, to your needs. We give examples saying this is what they did in this country, this is what they did there, but then we will never be able in these resources to say, oh, in this, you know, tiny little community, which is very specific, this is what you should do and this is what you should do there, right? So the, it's more methodology you know your context much better than, than me and so you know like how to adapt it how how to make sure like your cultural specificities differences are taken into consideration hi so here i want to build up a bit on the actually the discussion that rocio was trying to avoid which is the conceptualization so of course meaning Pragmatically, I do agree with you that we have to do something because we have the pattern of recruitment, even though meaning it's not conflict, but I still think it would be useful for us in the region with so many countries, you know, <laughs> having children involved in, in armed violence, meaning Colombia has a clear framework, so it's a different case. Mm -hmm. But for Brazil, for Ecuador, for Haiti, for Mexico, we do would like to understand how the alliances see the situation of armed violence in this region and more or less what's the proposal. Of course, the operational guidelines, you know, they do fit and we could adapt it, but it would be good also to extend the framework mm -hmm. either on development context for armed violence or how do we frame it on humanitarian settings. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. So I think, yeah, we won't have time to open this debate right now, but thank you for raising it. I think the session that we have, uh, the thematic session 4.2 tomorrow evening, um, uh, so tomorrow afternoon, sorry, it's, uh, we will tackle some of these uh, questions more from the legal perspective, like what is different between the two, and then then move to the practice, you know, like, okay, how do we practically address uh, these issues? We'll have uh, actually Brazil will be represented, Haiti and uh, Honduras. So we're going to have examples from the region on um, how to practically respond to this, uh, to this issue of armed violence. I hope I responded. <laughs> okay, who's next? Thank you very much. Actually, I was going to build on what exactly was said, because I believe that part of the context that we live in certain countries, such as Ecuador, are armed groups, but they're related to criminality. And uh, that changes. And we don't know how much, we, or we're not certain about how much it changes, but we needed to adapt it. 
uh, to our reality and uh, to be able to hold those regional conversations because there are criminal groups that are recruiting and the rules that come from international conventions don't apply because there's not even interest of those criminal groups of or even the states to hold some negotiations. So the reality is that these working groups, the states and the social organizations are exposed to many risks whenever they act or they intervene. And the type of violence that boy, girls and adolescents experience within these processes of illegality is even more violent and very complex to address. So the only thing that I can say is that what UNICEF and many countries have raised their voice, have said, even from international cooperations, that uh, we are here to hold this debate, yes, at a regional level, because we need to tackle this at a regional level. There is, yes, it is important to adapt this tools, this methodology to our context in order for us to be better advocates in front of or in face of the government in our countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I take note that UNICEF is ready to organize a regional conference on this topic. <laughs> All right. Uh, next. Okay. Thank you so much for the presentation, the resources, the tools. It was very interesting. Uh, and I wanted to ask you if you could comment on the example that you mentioned about South Sudan in 2018. Uh, you mentioned that when the gender approach was changed, uh, we found out that there were not two or three percent of girls recruited, but rather 38 percent. Um, so I, I was curious to know about that because uh, it was known long before 2018 that girls uh, could be uh, recruited in the form of wives or for sexual violence purposes, even if they were not taking arms or if they were not actively uh, taking part in hostilities, uh, they would still be uh, considered child soldiers. Uh, so I, I was curious to know what was the shift of mentality in 2018 that that gender approach that was introduced uh, that that gave you those uh, those very different results. Thank you. Yeah. So the context of South Sudan at that time was um, that it was like a formal kind of demobilization, a disarmament, demobilization, reintegration program, which is a kind of program that we don't see so often anymore. Um, so those armed groups were um, identified. They were all sitting in barracks, you know, waiting to be demobilized. And so there were like visits to those barracks, you know, to identify uh, children. And then when they went there, the people were saying, oh, this is my daughter, this is my wife, this is my sister. And we were never able to identify those girls. Like the, um, the commanders or like the, 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 the husband, they were always like blocking any interaction with these girls when they were going from barracks to barracks. And so they developed different strategies. First, in those... Um, uh, missions like group of people who were going from barracks to barracks they added women before it was only men and they added women who, who were uh, able to you know speak the language start talking to the girls that was the first thing and the second thing they provided services to uh, to the girls um, sexual and reproductive health and uh, vaccination for that for their babies and that was a way to get them out of the barracks and then to start talking to them and then identifying them and say, well, these are the services that are um, offered to you. If you want to leave, you can. Another question? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I um, just want to echo also in Western Central Africa, we're um, uh, using those uh, those uh, designed uh, design uh, handbook and uh, it's very useful. I didn't know there were so many uh, so many guidance. Um, we my my question is about digital protection. Have we explored um, uh, digital propaganda as a driver? Mm. Um, I mean, in I know that in some context uh, it's quite uh, important. Uh, maybe less in our Western Central African context because there's so not, not so much access, but we've been seeing growing disinformation and uh, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, 
peer-to-peer recruitment. Yes, so influence. So I wanted to understand if this is something you've been looking at uh, yeah. in, this, in this context. Thank you. Yeah, so these are parts of the strategies to recruit children, like propaganda. Uh, there are some examples from Syria, in particular, Syria, Iraq. The Islamic State has used that extensively, even all the way to Europe, you know, like recruiting children in Europe to travel all the way to Turkey and then uh, Syria. So there are many examples in these resources that you can find. I think it's interesting to really unpack like the strategy, how they portrait, um, for example, heroes. They have all these stories about those children who are shown as heroes. Uh, they have like weapons. They, the boys really self-identify a lot like with all the war movies so that they, they can uh, they see them as role models. You know, like I want to be like this boy carrying the weapon and then they make like all of these stories around this uh, these boys. We see that also with girls in um, in uh, Syria and Iraq. So like these are strategies. Yeah, there are some examples on how to address it. There is um, research done by uh, the UN University on this. Thank you. I will speak in Spanish. Um, but I, go I just want to comment on or following up what Rocio Aznar mentioned from UNICEF Mexico and the route that has been followed by Mexico with the National Observatory in order to prevent the recruitment of organized crime. And that would be an interesting example because followed by Sierra Leone and uh, Colombia and in international intervention. The most important phase is the situational diagnosis in order to identify the needs that we have as a state. That's number one. And we should also bring to the table the differences, which is very relevant in Mexico in regards to recruitment of Mexican boys and the recruitment of migrants. And they have different uses of the depending on what they recruit. In, and so that is very important to be considered. Thank you. Gracias. Mm. Yeah, no, these are like good, uh, good examples. Um, okay, go ahead, uh, Hector. I will speak in Spanish. Sandra, thank you very much. As you're able to see, this is a regional problem. Ecuador, Colombia, Honduras, Guatemala. This is a topic that we must certainly need more time for discussion. Colombia is a reference, yes. They have more experience in uh, this recruitment practice. So all of the different things that we have implemented in Honduras for prevention is simply copying what has been done in Colombia. However, um, I think I should highlight certain things that are very important. Number one, there's no statistic data from other countries, not even from Honduras, as to the number of children that have been recruited. Why? Because it's a very complex topic to approach because it's a dangerous topic. To ask a question about how many children have been part of the Mara or a gang or an organized crime, then it's going to be dangerous. That means that we need to shed some visibility as to the problem that we have at a regional level. So that's one thing. The other thing is what is happening with the countries, for example, in Honduras, in which we have crim criminal um, or, or organized criminal groups, we have gangs and smaller gangs, but many times the state is a, um, a entity that recruits minors for law enforcement and that law enforcement agencies many times are corrupted and they carried out like law enforcement activities but they, these law enforcers are even part of these organized crime groups so that is a problem Tomorrow, I will have the opportunity to explain about the, all the advancements that we have seen in Honduras and the different materials that we have. In Honduras, we have coyote that are recruiting children. And they're using children to, to bring in or lure in Venezuelan migrants, Colombian, and they even help them to go to the borders with Guatemala. In fact, uh, that's how children are being recruited by other children that are being trained by coyotes. So these are different profiles identified in the zone. 
So I just wanted to be part of what has been said. The overall need is to have a regional discussion. I know that it wasn't questions, it was just comments, but it's just a little bit of reflection of what is happening today in our region. Thank you. Yeah, the issue of security is definitely a, a problem. I think, yeah, Alex, who am I going next? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and in terms of thinking about regional advocacy, I also think it's useful to, to remember that when uh, the advocacy was done about the recruitment of children in armed conflict, it took decades to turn this into being a child rights, child protection issue. It started with the CRC, there was in 1990, 1989, 1990, there was Gratia Michelle's report in 96, there was OPAC in 2002, there were the Paris principles in 2007, and we're still seeing child recruitment going up in armed conflict. So just to say that when you're talking about how states don't necessarily see this as a child protection problem they see it as a security issue that was also the same in armed conflict and that's something that can also the narrative has to be changed every state goes to the com to the to the committee on the rights of the child they're judged on how they protect the right to life which is relevant for human rights context so there's many tools still in the human rights space that can be used for armed violence, contextualized, and to do this kind of advocacy, because it's not easy. And the push and the pull factors of why children join, why they're recruited, which types of organized crime, gangs, etc., are extremely complex to unpack, but they're also extremely complex to unpack in armed conflict, and yet we've still made significant progress. The other thing I just wanted to mention was that when we were talking about DDR, it's important to remember that children can come out of an armed group or an armed force at any time. In armed conflict, you don't need to wait till the end of the conflict. They can, they can be released, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, maybe one last question. Two. There's one. Ah, three. Three left. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't have a question. However, I just want to build on what has been said by my Mexican colleagues about the problems that we have in the northern barrier. This problem has been for more than 20 years. It's only served by a local organization, which is the in, um, Juarez um, organization, but that also has an impact in uh, our host um, houses. So these local children from what is are recruited at an early age for them to surveil the area, to traffic legal substances, or even to help people cross the border. When we approached the government, we presented this, this what was happening, and it wasn't until 2019 that the government agreed that this was a problem. This is just a reflection. I just want to build on the reflections from the different colleagues in Colombia. We have had this armed conflict for more than 60 years, and there is a prevention um, policies uh, for um, to, uh, children that are recruited for armed forces and the protection of the children. However, we seen that the first thing is to be able to, to come to have that closeness with the, the children. And we have worked about the use of the different um, tools that we have in order to be able to help um, um, to have some entry point with its armed groups in which we provide services such as cooking and other activities in which we see that the children are being used not directly as a soldier, but they are recruited for other uses, for example, cooking, other activities, micro trafficking, the tra transportation of weaponry, etc. 
I believe that that we needed to have hold of this regional reflections in order for us to share their experiences from the different countries that we are in conflict because it's not just the conflict but it's also drug dealing and uh, that is a cross-border problem so as Jorge just mentioned, we know that we're never going to get um, data from the number of children that have been recruited in Colombia. It's irrealistic that um, to get this information from the armed groups, they're not going to provide this. All we have are data that comes directly from the Colombian state. And it basically is just information from these um, children that have been recovered or um, are no longer linked with these armed forces and they have, are part of the society and they are helped through specific centers of the state. So the reports uh, that come from the UNHCR and UNICEF in the resolution 1218-2005, but in face of this new landscape that we have a program of this recovered children and the data that we have from all the different cases that we process and the advocacy that we have uh, with the government, we still see that we are we feel hopeless because recruitment is just increasing. I'm not sure if we have further data regarding the monitoring because we do know that this peace of treaty um, has only uh, uh, has led to an increase of recruitment of children. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay, last one. Gracias. Gracias por... Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak again. There was something that I missed out. In my opinion, and I work in, at the government side of things from, in the government of Mexico, there is something that we notice in the practice that is very important. There is a need to coordinate and to develop action protocols from civil society that they have been addressing this for many, for a very long time. The government uh, that uh, serve with intelligence, law enforcement, and justice application, we have noticed that there is no true linkage between uh, other type of services, including child protection, because it is child protection that receives all the information from the girls and adolescents. However, we see that there is a lack of process our policies in order to best address these populations because at the end, if they don't receive the services that they require, talking about basic services, they go back to these um, areas of conflict. This problem is so large that we have even, uh, it has been considered bringing to the table, working with the government of the United States regarding those children of this in, that are in the circuit. However, as I mentioned before, we do have the observatory. It does provide certain guidelines and different uh, elements to, to better understand, but we still need further coordination and integration among actors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm really happy to see that this topic uh, seems to raise a lot of interest. Uh, we have another session tomorrow where we can unpack a bit more what is specific to this region. So please, I'm advertising for my session tomorrow. <laughs> uh, before we close, just wanted to uh, tell you about um, a community of practice. So this is an online platform that we have set up. If you maybe know about the, the Alliance one, so there is the Child Protection and Humanitarian Action Community of Practice. And we have like a smaller group, which is a closed group, specifically focusing on CAFAG, where um, so all humanitarian actors, with the exception of governments, I'm sorry for the governments in the room, uh, can access the platform uh, and exchange, ask questions, uh, talk about um, what, they're, what they're doing, the results of uh, research, for example, and um, so I wanted to share with you uh, this, um, how, how to access the platform. So under your tables, you have the, this document. And on the, on the bottom right, you have a QR code. If you're interested, you can scan and then access the, the platform. So I'm just going to ask my, yeah. So um, 
what is very interesting about this platform is that it's available in multiple languages. So you can ask a question in Spanish and uh, Simon, for example, who is in DRC, who speaks French, can read in French your question. So you just click on the top and if you click Spanish, you will have the entire platform and all the posts of everyone translated in your language. So that's really a tool that allows, you know, people across the world to communicate, to ask questions, to share findings about their research, for example. I love this. Um, so if you see like here are some examples, for example, um, uh, Katie Seaborn asked a question about uh, case management SOPs. And then you have like four people who responded. And then some people can tag others and say, oh, I don't know the answer, but I know someone else who will know about it. You know, so like we tag each other. And so like this, we create this network of experts around the world who can share their uh, experience uh, with each other. So I just wanted to flag it. Also, if you're organizing a webinar, if you have your research findings, you'd like to disseminate it to this community, you can. So you go um, up and uh, you have like this drop down where you can find, like you can create a topic. You upload your picture and then your link to your webinar, for example, and everyone can access it. So just wanted a bit of advertisement as well for this platform. Uh, we have 700 members now but it's really uh, open and the more the the better yeah if you want to show up yes so here you have like um well now it's in spanish so i don't know um anyway you click one of these things maybe eventos like the little drop the arrow drop and here you will find like how to create a post and then um you have the thread as well where you can just uh, ask a question. It's, um, it's quite easy to, the arrow, not, not the event, the arrow next to it. Anyway, you will experience it uh, yourself. It's, uh, it's user-friendly, you will find your way. Um, and so feel free to join if you're interested to know more about the topic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.